introduce our speaker for today for Grand Rounds, Dr. David Friedman, who is known to most of you, if not all of you, uh, somebody who has been with us at UAB for many, many years, I believe since the late 80s. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus of Medicine and Epidemiology, and he has, uh, as you very well know, extensive experience in the field of travel medicine, uh, tropical diseases. He has been a key player in the really in the world of tropical medicine and, and uh, travel medicine for many, many years, being part of a number of um, societies and uh, has been editor in a number of journals as well. And of course, was a co-director for the Gorgas course and together with Eduardo Otuso uh, created this course in the 90s, which has been really a tremendous success and, and is one of the top courses, if not the top course in tropical medicine in the world. So uh, David, uh, every year gives us uh, some update in a topic related to uh, travel medicine. And today he's gonna be talking about uh, travel during the time, travel during the times of COVID. So David, thank you for, for being with us today. Thanks, uh, thanks for the uh, kind introduction, Martine, and uh, pleasure to be every with everybody again um, for our annual uh, update, um, which is more going to uh, going to talk less uh, than usual about vaccines and anti-malarials and uh, the usual travel medicine thing because many travel medicine clinics like ours are have been essentially closed for six months, uh, uh, six months or more, and not sure if things are going to pick up uh, soon. It's actually very difficult to travel right now, as you'll see um, during, um, during the course uh, of the uh, of of the talk. And um, I think I'm gonna to try to emphasize some of the data and some um, uh, of what's going on in terms of traveling as well as, um, as, well as just um, um, uh, uh, so some of the data and as, as well as some of the things and some of the uh, implementation. So it's gonna be, um, when we all start traveling internationally again, which hopefully won't be too far from now, but uh, not imminent. You know, I think there's going to be um, a new normal and uh, um, a lot of things not uh, recognized. But uh, understanding what's behind this, I think, um, is um, is going to be very is 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 um, is very um, is very important. Okay, um, so just a quick slide to start with. A colleague sent me this um, on Tuesday. Um, and this is uh, this is the new normal in Hong Kong, which of course is not going to necessarily um, apply everywhere. Um, but you arrive um, at Hong Kong Airport um, before you do anything. Um, they put a brace, they grab you, they put a bracelet on you, they send you to a seat with a, with a number. That's your number. You have a COVID test uh, taken, and uh, you sit there for um, three to three to six hours waiting for your negative COVID test. Of course, if it's positive, they put you in jail somewhere. Um, um, if it's negative, you have to quarantine for 14 days. And um, these monitors, a lot of countries are starting to use them. You know, Hong Kong's a smaller country, but actually um, not only do they, um, not only do they know where you are and can track whether you're moving around or not, um, six countries already have uh, introduced biosensors or bio trackers. Um, so they also monitor your heart rate and your body temperature at the same time as monitoring um, where you um, where you are. Um, okay, so the, the outline, um, I, I'm going to start um, really talking about um, uh, transmission on airplanes. And uh, that's been quite a controversial area and I've gotten a lot of media time on that um, recently. And then we're gonna move on to um, ports of entry and what's kind of going on as you move from country to country. A um, Little bit about airplane engineering in terms of um, uh, possible mitigation um, strategies uh, for, um, for flying, including some um, very interesting flight simulations. A few slides at the end about other modes of uh, transportation um, and uh, you know can, you know I can't even imagine and, and you won't be able to imagine after you see the data why why they just don't sink all the cruise ships right away and then um, and then then a little concluding uh, material so as far as uh, in-flight transmission is uh, concerned you know the problem's really been that it's very hard to prove and we just don't know what the number 
um, is and what the risk is and what goes on in different situations. Uh, there have been um, actually less than 15 peer reviewed um, pub, you know, official public health publications um, of flights with a possible um, um, COVID uh, transmission. And, you know, this is not my aphorism, but um, is very appropriate here. Absence of evidence, that's of transmission in flight. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, the burden of proof is high because, um, as, as we all know, um, there's significant pre-symptomatic transmission. There's um, also um, asymptomatic uh, transmission. Um, so secondary cases that get infected um, in flight, um, you know, may remain asymptomatic. So, you know, if you're not looking for them, if you're not testing everybody, you really don't know uh, what the infection rate in flight um, may be. And, um, you know, secondary cases may be uh, detected uh, as few as three days post-flight, but there's a very murky period because how can you, um, um, you know, how can you figure out um, without a lot of very, very careful study, you know, if somebody was infected in the airport, if somebody was infected on the way to the airport, if somebody was infected one day before the flight, as opposed to, you know, during the six or eight or 12 hours of the actual, um, you know, of the actual flight. So, um, uh, you know, that becomes uh, difficult without things like whole genome sequencing, which, you know, just hasn't been done that, um, you know, that much to prove who infected um, who. And um, what comes to attention are the mass outbreaks with a lot of infections on the same flight. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's been a lot of flights where one person's been infected and with all the disruption of, uh, of the pandemic, um, it's just, you know, been impossible to look for every possible case. Although, again, as I say, we think the risk is probably, you know, not huge. It's certainly um, there. Um, the ideal way to do, uh, to prove in-flight transmission um, you know, of course, would be to um, do a PCR on every passenger as soon as they arrive, um, put them in quarantine so they don't get infected uh, after arrival, um, do that for seven to 14 days, and then retest at the end of quarantine. That just doesn't happen many places. It happens in Hong Kong and, and maybe one or two other places, um, but certainly not in the United States or, or Europe, et cetera. So um, very difficult. Um, there are certainly plenty of people that have been flying with, um, uh, with infections. Um, and again, it's the long flights that tend to get, um, um, you know, scrutinized, uh, the international uh, wide body flights, you know, shorter domestic narrow body flights is, is, is just really um, a black box. And certainly the dynamics in a single aisle aircraft is going to be different than, than a two aisle um, aircraft. Um, I'd like to just put away, I'm not going to um, talk very much, um, you know, early on, as everybody knows, worried a lot about fomites and surfaces and things like that. And it, you know, it just doesn't seem to be um, an important um, um, factor. And, you know, same thing with planes, there's no, there's no real um, um, belief on this. There was one flight where a transmission um, was linked um, to a shared laboratory as the two people didn't have any contact with each other. They had a very careful epi um, study, um, but we don't know that much about ventilation in laboratories and the general model of airflow in planes um, does not go to um, the laboratories. So again, um, this has been discussed uh, by others and I'm not gonna go into all this um, hygiene theater that goes on um, uh, about keeping the planes um, clean. So um, I'm going to go through a few slides, it'll take a few minutes, but um, I'm going to go through a few slides on the most interesting um, um, published flights. And again, I'd like to emphasize that, you know, the problem here is the burden of, um, is the burden of, um, you know, proof and you need to really have the right circumstances. Um, you know, I, I, I'm an associate editor of the um, Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal and also um, a section editor in the Journal of Travel Medicine. And 
I've seen a huge number of manuscripts um, proposing in-flight transmission, and most of them have to be rejected because, you know, they really can't rule out the probability of some um, um, infection that occurred, you know, before or after um, the flight or, or in um, the airport. Um, but sometimes circumstances are in your favor. Here's probably what I think is the best study um, um, from Australia um, published in um, Emerging Infectious Diseases. This, this was a kind of a double play because of um, an involved cruise ship as well um, as an airplane. But there was a large outbreak on the Ruby Princess. Um, uh, at the time, um, there was uh, almost no local transmission in Australia uh, on the day the flight disembarked passengers um, um, in Sydney. Um, uh, there was a mix up. Uh, uh, there was this huge outbreak on the ship. 900 passengers got off the ship and were not screened in Sydney um, before they were um, allowed to go to the airport and uh, um, go all over the world um, and, and spread the infection there. It turns out um, when the whole genome sequencing was done that a unique strain, I think they called it A2P, um, um, a unique strain had actually developed during the cruise, which had never been described anywhere else ever before. So clearly only present on the cruise ship. Anyways, um, a bunch of these um, people got on, on, on a um, A330 from Sydney to Perth, about a five hour um, flight and um, 13 symptomatic index cases um, came directly from the ship. Um, nine were later classified as infectious um, during uh, the flight, and they clearly infected um, um, 11 other people on the flight um, 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 because of being uh, because of looking at the sequences and the fact that the sequences had, had never been seen on land um, um, before. Um, and um, so uh, let's just look at the seat map uh, here. Sorry, and this was early on, so there was no ma no masking on board. And so this is the seat plan. Um, this is the flight on the 19th of March. And basically, if you look uh, down here, um, um, infectious primary cases are one, infectious in flight, and means non-infectious in flight. But the ones that were symptomatic and culture positive are here. But anybody, um, anybody that has this um, sort of pink in the middle um, is an index um, is an index uh, case. And the secondary um, cases have a two. So you can see the secondary cases were um, the secondary cases were here. Um, they were all in the mid cabin. For whatever reason, the people sitting um, um, in the back um, didn't seem to transmit it to anybody else. Now, they were unable to follow up everybody on the flight because they didn't know what was going on at the time of the flight. They contacted the people on the flight say, and said, if you're sick, you know, please um, get tested. Um, but not everybody came forward to get tested. So people that were asymptomatic and remained asymptomatic probably um, were not detected um, in this. So this is at least 11 highly proven uh, transmissions um, on this um, one flight. Um, another interesting flight, they didn't do sequence, but they had really tight epidemiology um, here. And this was a flight from London to um, Hanoi, which um, only had a single positive um, case, obviously highly infectious super spreader um, type. Uh, the interesting thing here for those people that think they're safe in business class, um, uh, well, you're, you're, you're not really, because what happened on this flight here is the index case was seated here, and you could see everybody else that got infected there. There was only one index case um, on this uh, particular um, on this particular um, flight. Um, Sixty-two percent. Some of the seats were empty in business. Sixty in the end. Sixty-two percent of the people in business class um, got um, infected. Um, and the reason they knew they didn't in this case that they didn't get infected before the flight was that um, at the time of this um, flight on the second of March, there was essentially no. Um, transmission in the UK. Um, this index case 
um, had actually been in Italy. If you remember, the outbreak started in Italy, had been on business in Italy a few days before, and was just traveling home um, via, um, via London. And there was also no transmission in Vietnam at the time. So um, very high um, infection rate uh, here. Again, this was before, um, this was before the masking uh, days. Um, this um, is, a, is the other one to date that has um, sequence, that has um, um, detailed uh, sequencing. And basically it's a, a Hong Kong um, couple um, that got infected either in Toronto or in Boston before a flight from Boston to Hong Kong. Um, they were seated together and they managed to infect um, two flight attendants. And uh, again, there's a small possibility, you know, that something else happened, but really the sequences were absolutely identical um, between uh, these two people and, um, and the flight attendants. And it was not that common um, a sequence. And it was certainly a sequence that was not present at Hong Kong, in Hong Kong um, at the time uh, of the uh, flight. Sorry, and again, these two people were in, um, these two people were in business class. Okay, um, so going um, going on here, um, these are um, this is another interesting flight because the people were um, the people were um, um, uh, masked um, on on the flight. This was one of these Hong Kong situations where they do PCR um, on everybody on arrival, quarantine them, check the PCR um, later on. And so um, there were actually 27, this is I think the record that's been documented, there were 27, these were Pakistani workers returning to Hong Kong. And um, uh, there were 27 PCR positive um, asymptomatic passengers on arrival, and they had um, um, two later that were negative on arrival later turned positive. So there were two likely transmissions um, despite masking um, uh, despite, despite masking on the flight. The other interesting thing is that screening was in place. I mean, this was, um, this was, um, this was during June, late June. Um, so people were very aware. Um, these people went through screening temperature checks when they left Pakistan. They actually had to change planes in Dubai. Um, they again went through all the screens, temperature checks, symptom checks, everything like that, again in Dubai. Um, and they still made it through and uh, infected, uh, infected other people. Um, it, 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 it's not so um, it's not so terrible. Um, um, uh, you know, th this is the slide shows kind of the flip side of the coin. So we looked into the public database um, and because um, Hong Kong monitors everybody. And we actually, uh, because of all the disease going on in Pakistan at the time, um, we actually checked all the other flights for a period of about two or three um, weeks and actually identified five Dubai to Hong Kong flights um, that had multiple um, arrival, uh, multiple passengers positive on arrival, 10 passengers, 19, 13, 9, 7. Um, and um, most um, um, and 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 most most were um, asymptomatic on arrival, and actually there were no transmissions on any of these five flights, and that's about fifteen hundred or two thousand people, you know, on flights with huge numbers of, of people infected um, who did not get infected. But again, this is after this was Emirates Airline, which is absolutely meticulous. And everybody was masked. Everybody was, you know, monitored. The flight attendants were, you know, gowned and masked and everything um, like that. So um, it's not all, you know, bad news. There's a finite risk here, um, but it's not an absolute risk, even if you're on a plane with um, a lot of people. The key, of course, as always, is masking and um, staying away from people. Let me move and talk. Um, let me move and talk a little bit about. Um, 
some uh, other things that happened. Evacuation flights. Um, so um, once the border started closing, a lot of governments arranged evacuation flights, millions of passengers. Um, the US government actually helped to coordinate um, probably a thousand or more evacuation flights. Um, um, you know, 100,000 or more people. And basically we have no data on any of these. Um, and um, most governments or no governments are keeping um, stuff on this, or if they are, um, you know, this was, you know, remember this is all in February and March now. Um, if they are, um, they, um, they have not published um, um, the data. Um, several cruise ships where people later got evacuated, um, as I mentioned with the Ruby Princess um, um, before, um, have, have gotten extremely high uh, media profiles. I'll talk about the ships. Um, I'll talk about the ships later on. Um, I don't think anybody's really hiding any data. I think nobody has the data with the chaos and disruption of the, um, of the pandemic. Um, you know, again, they just didn't did, P the, 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 there was just no way to do PCR on every person that arrived on one of these evacuation flights and then follow up all the other passengers um, for a couple of weeks, whatever. It's just, um, you know, just too much going on. And of course, in the US, there was um, in, you know, in February and March, a dire shortage of, you know, tests uh, for sick people. And so, you know, to use the tests for, um, you know, to use the tests for, um, for um, um, airplane passengers for a public health investigation was not was not the top um, of the list. Um, there are a couple of other, um, there are a couple of evacuation flights that also um, support the utility um, of um, masking. And um, the, the, the Koreans actually did, the Korean CDC actually did a wonderful job in getting, um, um, in getting uh, well, not only in keeping the numbers in general down in their country, but in getting their folks home and, you know, sent teams out to places like Italy, you know, to, you know, make sure that nobody got on the plane that shouldn't get on, um, uh, that shouldn't get on the plane and, you know, very masking, very heavy masking, et cetera. So, you know, this, um, this again, this one flight from Italy to Seoul, from Milan to Seoul, um, six PCR positives did, you know, slip through in Milan and um, infect uh, one other um, um, person who claims that she only took off her mask um, for 10 or 15 minutes while she went to the bathroom. And um, um, they, they, they did such detailed epidemiology, they were able to tell that one of the index cases had used the bathroom, you know, just before she was um, um, in there. Could be a fomite thing, uh, but again, I suspect that it's one of those, um, you know, the bathroom's one of those poorly ventilated places, and um, you know, it, it, it may still have been uh, due to airflow um, in um, in the bathroom. Um, a bunch of other papers have really confused uh, the matter here, and um, really, you know, in, in in the rush to publish um, a lot of really lousy studies. Um, um, you know, got, got published, which, um, which proved, um, you know, very little. Um, the most recent one to get some publicity was this Euro surveillance um, um, report, uh, which I'll talk about um, in a second. Um, these other ones here have fairly significant um, um, flaws in them. They just didn't do the epidemiologic investigation um, to rule out where possible secondary cases got infected. You really can't prove um, in-flight uh, transmission um, on, on, any of, uh, on any of those. Um, so this has gotten in the past couple of weeks. Um, um, again, um, you know, they do say in Euro surveillance linked to air travel. They don't say in the title um, in-flight transmission uh, and they go way out on a limb um, with, without any really good data. They do have some whole genome sequencing, uh, but the five people that they were able to sequence, um, it's really um, not clear what their contact could have been with each other and they don't identify um, where they were sitting or, or anything um, like that. You know, I believe it, it, reading it, you know, with a critical eye, um, there were likely two in-flight transmissions with, uh, you know, a total of um, 13 cases on board. Um, um, and again, the point is they were masked. 
um, in this case. It was a long flight from uh, Doha to uh, Dublin. So um, again, some transmission even with masking. So again, it's, it, it, it is a risk. If things aren't done right, then, um, then there can be um, transmission. Um, I think I mentioned this already. Uh, the, um, you know, just the lack of published public data. There's, there's lots of documentation and even some public websites that list all the flights that had known, or at least retrospectively, had known pos positive passengers on board. Um, but if any investigation was done into possible secondary cases, um, it, nobody has pulled it out or done the investigations out of those, um, out of those. And, you know, that includes in the US, um, this has not been published anywhere, but somehow um, they, um, it got into a, a, you know, an interview with somebody senior um, at the CDC with the Washington Post. Um, so at this time, which was a couple of months ago, CDC stated that they knew of 1,600 um, COVID cases on domestic flights in the US, and they knew uh, of 11,000 contacts within two rows. But um, my understanding is speaking that they just, they haven't published it yet because they just don't have any data. Um, that would, you know, meet any standards of any uh, epidemiologic uh, investigation. So um, um, to summarize some of these um, um, in-flight um, studies, um, you know, at least the three major best documented in-flight transmissions had clustering in terms of having the seat maps available. You saw that. Um, um, so proximity is definitely a factor. Um, masking was not mandated on those flights with mass transmission. Um, and then, you know, you, uh, to summarize, you know, the Emirates flight 25 with two transmissions. On the other hand, five other Emirates flights, no transmissions with um, masking. And um, it would be very interesting to look at data on so-called in-flight transmissions before masking became mandatory and um, after it became uh, mandatory. But again, that, that data is really um, not, um, not, not available. Um, so um, again, absence of evidence is not evidence of um, absence. Um, a lot of economic and political uh, circumstances here that discourages detailed um, investigations. And so we just don't know a number. You know, everybody wants to know what's the number. You know, the airline industry will say it's essentially zero. Um, and they put that in a press conference and I, you know, got into some um, stuff in the media. <clears throat> Um, but we really, we really don't know the number. And, and I don't think it's important to know the number for um, flights without precautions. I mean, moving forward, we need to know what the risk is. If, you know, people adhere to masking, the planes get cleaned, all the things get done. That's what we really need to uh, know um, in order to, for people to decide whether they're willing to take uh, the risk or not, especially, you know, if they're in a um, vulnerable, uh, in a vulnerable population. Um, okay, and um, all, all the detail of the studies is in a um, art, is in that article there, and that's uh, um, the reference um, for you. Okay, so let's look a little bit about um, some quarantine, some arrival stuff, and also a little bit about engineering um, on the airplanes. So you know, it's not. Um, you know, it's not just the airplane, it's what goes on in the airport, which I'm not going to talk about um, um, today. It's more or less gate to gate, um, but obviously you can get infected. Travel is a process. You have to deal with risk at the, you know, if you're going to travel, you go somewhere. So, you know, you've got to deal, you know, one of the reasons people aren't, um, you know, traveling is not only the, the risk in flight, it's you know, what's going to happen when you arrive? Are they going to put you in quarantine for two weeks? How many times do you have to be tested when you arrive? Uh, in addition to the risk, potential risk at the destination, which in most destinations, unfortunately, right now is, uh, is, is, very, um, is very high. Also, you know, what are the consequences? What's the medical care like at your destination? And, you know, especially, are you going to be able to get home? You know, it depends, you know, wh wh where you live, whatever. But if you're sick, if you come down with COVID, you know, who's going to fly, um, you know, who's going to fly you home? 
um, if you want to come home, um, you know, for for um, for treatment or, or or to be with your um, to be with your family. Um, so this is the impact. Um, so as of this week, um, we're at about 34 per domestically. Um, we're at about 34, well, domestically and internationally. Um, the US, according to TSA, we're at about 34% of the passenger numbers uh, we were at uh, at the same time um, last year. Um, the European hubs are really suffering. Um, um, London and Frankfurt are at 19 and 17. Um, percent um, Singapore and Asia because you know there are some safe destinations etc in Asia although they they often have strict quarantine on arrival uh, Singapore airport claims to be uh, at 54 percent of passenger numbers compared um, to last year um, as far as border hurdles are concerned um, this is a map we do twice a week actually um, and um, you know, it's not just international borders, it's domestic internal borders um, as well. And there are actually about 12 or 13 states that have entry restrictions um, um, right now. Um, the, uh, the color is, is just the um, um, incidence of infection uh, per state. And then um, <clears throat> footnotes with the little numbers next to the state's names um, indicate their um, indicate their level of uh, restriction, whether they require quarantine on arrival, as New York is very serious about um, right now. And for the ones that require quarantine on arrival, um, can you test out? In other words, if you get a negative, if you if you take a PCR um, test within a certain number of days of arrival, uh, can you test out of the seven to fourteen day um, quarantine uh, <clears throat> for that um, state? Um, needless uh, to say, for a long time, um, Alabama was worse uh, than a number of other states. So um, people from Alabama were really, there was a whole bunch of states where Alabamians um, um, weren't, um, weren't, uh, weren't welcome um, at all. Now, you know, New York has all the states. It, it just finally built up and, you know, 47 out of 50 states ended up on New York's red, red list. And, you know, so they just said, you know, everybody has to quarantine now. Um, um, coming um, coming in. Um, this is these are worldwide borders. So this is just a snapshot. Um, there's a lot more detail and granularity to it um, than than this um, slide um, shows. Um, but you know the, the very darkest blue means you just can't go there. At, nobody nowhere. The borders are just um, completely closed um, to um, anybody that's not a national um, of that country. Uh, the next shade partially um, restrictive, um, you know, applies to most countries. But you can see, you know, that often includes, you know, you can go, but you're going to have to quarantine, you're going to have to be tested multiple times, um, etc. And only a small number of countries are just like totally, um, you know, um, wide open. Um, and I guess, you know, Brazil's a nice place to go, uh, Mexico, um, you know, um, very violent place, but not, not really that many places that are, um, that are wide open. And then um, very complicated, and this keeps us busy, and I have a whole team of people busy um, on this, then, um, you know, every other country that has restrictions has long, long lists of things that have to be done and they have red countries and yellow countries and green countries and depending which country you're coming from or what your passport is, uh, you know, different groups of passengers, um, sorry, different groups of passengers um, have to do, um, have to do different, um, have to do different things in terms of testing and quarantine and it's different for nationals, different for foreigners, if the foreigners are allowed in um, at all, um, uh, at all now. And, and as you probably know, America Americans are welcome almost, you know, almost nowhere now, um, probably only about 20, 20 or 25 countries um, right now. Um, so, um, as I said, um, most countries, if you're from a really bad country, you know, like the United States, most countries just totally prohibit um, entry. Um, um, over 120 countries 
require even foreigners coming from so-called good or green countries to have a negative um, PCR from a test taken, usually two to three to four days um, um, prior to um, prior to travel. Um, I would note it is a P it is a nucleic acid test that, that is required. Um, um, antibody tests, antigen tests, rapid tests. Um, are, 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 are just no go. It has to be a PCR um, result. And all these 120 countries um, have really, um, have really um, stuck to that. Um, 50 additional countries, 240 countries in the world, by the way, um, 50 additional countries to the 120 require a negative uh, PCR in order to test out. So they have a quarantine, but you can test out of the um, um, quarantine. Um, and then, you know, there's some very extreme countries. China just actually got more severe um, 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 last, um, last week. Um, and they actually, I didn't put it in the slide um, yet. You actually need to have both a negative PCR and a negative IgM against SARS-CoV-2 done no longer than 48 hours before you get on the plane. And so getting those done and getting a result, you know, is, 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 quite, is, is quite a challenge and they're gonna have to back off on this, um, 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 certainly. Um, and then post-arrival hoops, even if you have a pre-arrival COVID, there's many countries, even if you have uh, uh, 80 countries, even if you have a pre-flight PCR, you need an arrival PCR um, to be done. Sometimes they do it free. Sometimes you, you're, you're going to need to pay for it. Sometimes you're going to need to quarantine uh, until the result comes back. Um, you know, um, so there's a wide variety um, there. Um, I just I talked in the first slide about the um, trackers and biosensors, um, et cetera, which are becoming, uh, you know, so if you have privacy um, issues, there's nothing you can do um, about this. So, you know, if you're a person with privacy issues, there's going to be countries uh, that you don't want to um, that you don't want to be um, going with. And also probably even faster. This is pretty sophisticated, especially when travel picks up again, you know, wearable devices. Um, uh, but mandatory tracking apps, I think, are going to probably be the norm in many countries. You know, you've got to download the tracking app onto your phone and show, you know, before you pass through immigration, show them that you have, you know, this app on your phone and uh, that, that, it's, um, that it's activated. And, you know, and I assume if you turn it off, you know, if you turn it off, then, you know, they come after you or something. Um, I already showed you that. Um, again, these are just some examples um, um, here. Uh, if you look at the slides later, of you know, very complicated lists of countries. They often change once or twice a week. So, you know, if you're contemplating travel, you really need to be able to go to a source uh, that's going to be able to give you this kind of, you know, detail. You know, foreigners who've been outside the following countries. Um, may not enter, um, you know, that's a red list as opposed to a green list, um, um, you know, for, um, for other countries and, you know, different conditions for different countries and, and foreigners versus nationals and residents. So uh, quite, quite a complicated uh, situation for the uh, potential world uh, traveler right now. Um, one piece of good news for those of you that do need to travel or want to travel and need a PCR, um, if you have 138 bucks, um, you know, it's not that hard to do and, and the results um, come back uh, so far right now um, are coming back quite quickly, uh, definitely within the required um, two to three days. So you go online to Quest, you know, you pay them $138, they FedEx you, um, you know, a self-testing um, kit, um, you put it in a FedEx box, they get it the next morning and, you know, you get the result um, in, in a couple of days um, at most. So, um, um, so, so it's not hard, that hard to do, but it's, it's, it's $138 um, a person uh, each time. And they don't want, you know, they don't want to deal with insurance or anything like that. I mean, you know, you're, if you do this, you know, you're paying for it. There's about 10 or 15 other companies that do, you know, similar, um, but, you know, you probably want to stick with one of the, um, you know, more reliable, well-known uh, company uh, lab, lab testing uh, 
labs. Okay, so let's move on to um, let's move on to a few things about the planes. Um, and so, um, you know, the argument, the you know, the bottom line here, um, you know, on the planes is, um, and, and a lot of work's been done in the past six months. Actually, the ventilation works extremely well, assuming the plane is well maintained and all that. The ventilation works extremely well. It works as it's supposed to. It works as it's designed. It's been proven, as I'll show you, you know, with, with a number of elaborate studies. But just as a reminder, the air comes in from the top depending on whether it's an Airbus or a Boeing, um, um, you know, the exact place where it comes in from the top, it comes in from two places, you know, it can be here in some of the planes, it comes in from the very top here and then it, from here, but it comes in from two places at the top and the air gets pushed um, down. And then if you look down at your feet, um, there's little, um, uh, uh, um, it, ex it exhales um, um, at the bottom of where your um, feet are. Um, it's helped by the so-called gaspers, the overhead um, vents um, as well, although it's not clear that they're um, needed. It's not clear that the gaspers make a big difference, but the overwhelming flow, as you can see from this computer model here, um, and this, this has been shown quite well, and, and, you know, and I think this is, um, this is definitely um, robust. It's down, the, the, the flow is down, and it's extremely robust um, um, flow. This is a very nice diagram. This is you know, a term we're going to see more and more of because people are going to start wanting to know about their apartment buildings and their office buildings and things like that. Um, air changes per hour are what people are talking about. And this is outside air. This tells you how much outside air um, gets, you know, pumped in um, per hour. So, you know, commercial aircraft, the 25 or 30 air changes uh, per hour, um, as you know, you know, hospital patient rooms and uh, even operating rooms, et cetera, are less uh, typical building, office buildings going to have five to eight air changes, um, uh, five to eight air changes uh, uh, per hour, same as your um, grocery store. So this really is a very robust ventilation, um, um, ventilation uh, um, system while the engines uh, are running. And I'll get back to that in a, um, in, uh, in a minute. And also you have a huge, you know, they really do, you know, it's engine air. So you really do get a lot of fresh air. Um, you know, on your aircraft uh, uh, as well. This was done. Um, this was done mostly in wide-body aircraft, but there's no real reason to think that it's different in a narrow body. This is a study that's um, going to be. It, it hasn't been peer-reviewed or published yet, um, but it's gotten a lot of publicity, and I think generally an excellent, hugely expensive. Um, study uh, financed by the military, by the Air Force uh, Transportation um, Command, but it was actually done by Boeing and some private um, contractors and United Airlines supplied a couple of, I'm sure, very finely maintained and finely tuned, you know, Fair, you know, new 767s and 777s and mannequins and 130 of these monitors um, and um, uh, with um, fluorescent uh, particles. Uh, they only used they used one micron particles actually um, in this one. So that's uh, you know that's uh, they they didn't use a wide variety of droplets and aerosols and things like that. They they just did it. Um, they just did it to look at the one micron. Um, uh, the one micron um, aerosols. Um, but a lot of readings were taken. They did it on the ground. They did it on the air. Um, you know, hundreds of um, readings. So as I said, um, fluorescent virus um, particles um, assumed a, a quiet breathing. They did a couple of um, other simulations. Um, they did some assumptions here, which you know nobody really knows. Um, so they assumed um, a production of 4,000 um, infectious virions um, per hour, and that an infectious dose for humans is 1,000 virions. I mean, th those are numbers that you know people are modeling now, whatever. Um, it's probably in, in the rough right range, but we don't know. Um, you know we don't know um, for sure. The bottom line result of hundreds of experiments, um, they say, is um, you know only 0.3% um, of the uh, particles, no uh, one micron, um, no other size, um, got as far as the passenger seated directly next. 
you know, um, the airlines are not going to look at spacing. The airline's position is that it's totally unviable to fly with any empty seats. And the business about leaving seats empty is just, you know, not even on the table for the, um, you know, for the airlines. Um, but again, you know, the claim is that it really doesn't matter because only 0.3%, um, you know, get to the person sitting quietly next to you um, in economy um, class. And then they did some math and said, you know, based on this one infection per 54 hours uh, flight time, no infections during a 12 hour um, 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 flight. But this again, seated passengers sitting there quietly, doesn't account, they only assumed one infectious passenger on board, doesn't account for human to human behavior, boarding, deplaning, eating, talking, laboratory visits, exposure to flight attendants, you know, going up and down the aisle or pre or post flight exposure. So, you know, nice demonstration that the systems um, work. Um, coughing, um, um, they did some simulations with um, coughing and decided that surgical masks, not cloth masks, surgical masks provided 90% protection against uh, these um, droplets. So again, if somebody's coughing, you know, I'll, I'll show you some math on that in a second. Doesn't matter if you keep the gaspers on or, or off. So this is reassuring. Certainly no data on poorly maintained um, aircraft, uh, but this is the mechanics of it, is, 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 what, I'd, um, is what I'd say. Um, this very interesting study is still um, uh, preprint on MedArchive, but it's done by two gurus in the field, Marion Koopmans in, in, in the Netherlands, David Fisman in um, Toronto. And um, they actually modeled all the publications that have been done, as we know, um, um, as we know, um, you know, one, the DFSO is days from symptom onset, you know, um, and so they focused on the most infectious, uh, well, they focused on everything, but I'm focusing on the most infectious stage, which is one day from symptom um, um, onset. Um, they looked, uh, they modeled talking, singing, breathing, um, et cetera. And these are the numbers they come, came up with in terms of uh, respiratory viral load. So, um, singing 350, talking 328, and um, just quietly breathing. And quietly breathing is the way they did those airline simulations. Uh, 1.73 virions, infectious virions per minute. Um, the confounder, of course, is what if somebody slips through your screening and they're sick or they get sick, you know, eight hours into a 12 hour flight. Um, you know, they, they have about 300. Um, you know, per single, they have about 300 infectious variants per single cough. And, you know, you can multiply that out over, um, you know, over a 12 hour flight if somebody starts coughing, you know, right after uh, they, right after they close the doors, so to speak. And, um, you know, a little bit of math, you know, they say that 0.3%, you know, uh, reach the adjacent passenger seat. The mask, you know, may stop up to 90%, at least of the, you know, one micron uh, particles. So there is some probability, um, you know, of people getting um, infected. Um, one thing I want to mention is, um, which you probably haven't heard of before, um, and this, um, if there's one thing I, I, I in touch a couple of times a week with the medical director of, uh, you know, IATA and some other airline um, people. This is the one thing that really scares the airline people. They don't talk about it. It's not much in their press conferences, whatever. Um, this fantastic airflow on the airplane, it only is true for sure when the engines are running. The ECS is the environmental, um, um, the environmental control systems. And um, um, if the engines are off, the plane needs to be ventilated another way. Now, if the airport has these to hook up, or one of the things that's often on the uh, jet bridge, there are no standards for these. There are no HEPA filters. Um, um, there are no HEPA filters um, in these. Uh, um, the, the, there's various kinds of um, um, filters in them. They don't always get hooked up right away. Um, an airplane has something called an APU, auxiliary power unit. 
Um, it sits in the tail. I don't know if you ever looked at the tail of the plane. The, the, the reason that there's an opening here is there actually is a tiny little turbine engine um, there, which burns fuel, so it costs money to run, it pollutes, it makes noise. Um, so a lot of air, you know, and then um, th that powers an internal ventilation system. But many airports, and this is going to have to change, many airports do not allow you to run the APU at the gate. Many airports don't allow APU use at all. So, you know, the problem is when the engines are off, when the air external air conditioning is off, you know, when they detach this and then there's some delay in pushing back, you know, and then you have to push back, then you can't start the engines until you push back. There may be significant delays where there's very little or no ventilation um, in the plane. And unfortunately, this often occurs um, during the most important times. That's getting, um, that's, um, that's boarding the plane and deplaning. There's often when you're close to people, everybody's standing up, everybody's rushing for the doors. Um, everybody's saying, I'm out of here. I don't need to wear my mask anymore. Um, this is a really vulnerable time that scares a lot of um, people. Not much uh, innovation in terms of keeping the planes clean. They do have these electrostatic sprayers now, which cause the disinfectants to uh, stick a little better um, to the seats. Uh, more airlines are using uh, UV robots uh, like, are, like are used in, in some hospital um, settings. Let me spend the last couple of minutes um, talking about cruising. Um, and and I, there's been a huge number of papers and a huge kerfuffle uh, about these um, cruise ships. And I just want to hit, um, uh, you know, some real highlights. Everybody knows about the one in Japan, the Diamond um, Princess. And the bottom line is that there's no question, and, and, you know, and it's been done, it's been modeled, they've done the sequencing, everything like that. It was a single passenger a single sick passenger, same strain, a single six passenger um, um, that um, caused this entire outbreak where 700 people um, were infected um, um, on, the, um, on the cruise uh, ship and they identified uh, a mutation and everything like that. The Ruby Princess, there were um, hundreds if not thousands uh, over a thousand infections on, on that one. And as I said, a new strain actually evolved um, during uh, the cruise. Uh, one in the US, the Costa Luminosa, again, um, um, ill evacuated uh, passengers. <coughs> and we're not gonna know how many infections on planes. <coughs> Excuse me, that actually, um, that actually um, caused. This is a great experiment. This is brand new. It was just published last night in the New England um, because very controlled, it's the military, very controlled um, um, circumstance. Everybody was tested. And this is pretty scary data, actually, for anybody that ever wants to get on a big ship again, although you know an aircraft carrier is not um, um, very typical. It's actually very bad news for military readiness um, as well. But basically, 5,000 um, on this aircraft carrier, 27% um, got infected. Um, during a very short um, outbreak. Um, the, um, at the time of testing, I mean, they recognized an outbreak and started testing everybody. Um, and they, they actually got them off the ship very quickly as well. Uh, once they hit port, 77% um, had no symptoms at the time of the initial positive test. And 45% um, of those never became a, a, a symptomatic. So they were true asymptomatics, 45%. Um, percent. Again, these are young, you know, I mean, people on an aircraft are, you know, carrier by definition are at the peak of physical health and everything um, like that. But in a relatively young, healthy population, 45% um, asymptomatic. But on the other hand, um, you know, even in this very, very healthy population, you know, almost 2% ended up in the hospital, you know, 0.3% uh, ICU and one, one actually, um, one actually uh, died. So this is, to me, even more frightening than the cruise ship, um, than the cruise ship um, data. Um, what's happening moving forward with cruise ships, new guidance from the CDC uh, last week, 
There's not going to be any cruising till February. Um, huge barriers put up. Um, cruises are going to be seven days um, or less. And this is only cruises, you know, from U.S. waters. Um, they have not set out any parameters for masking. They've not issued all the technical guidelines uh, yet, but, the, but it doesn't actually mention um, guidance. And I think they were waiting for after the election to, you know, get stuff about masking um, um, in, uh, in uh, the guidelines. And again, this is what cruising, for those of you that cruise, this is what cruising is going to look like. There's going to be antigen testing shoreside before you get on. Crew has to have PCR before they get on. Crew has to have weekly um, PCRs. Um, they're going to have to have certified PCR capability on board for passengers to become sick uh, after boarding. Um, and um, and uh, everybody's going to have to have, and passengers are going to have to have an antigen test before they get off and have the result of the antigen test um, before, um, before they uh, get off. You know, modified meal service, occupancy, and, you know, entertainment uh, venues. Um, care agreements to be able to evacuate people just about anywhere very uh, quickly should they become um, ill. And then uh, if a certain, they haven't decided the percentage, if a certain number of cases occur, um, then you're going to have to end the cruise, quarantine all the passengers, get them off and keep them in quarantine, put them on shore somewhere and keep them in quarantine for 14 days after the cruise, um, you know, no matter, um, no matter what, uh, no matter what happens. Last thing is um, is um, trains, buses, etc. Um, this is what we're doing at the holidays to visit our son in uh, Connecticut. Um, so we're, we're, we have a sleeper compartment. Uh, there's one train at the Amtrak Crescent runs from Birmingham to New York Penn Station. He's going to pick us up there. But the trains do have 12 to 15 changes uh, per hour. You can get yourself in a private compartment, close the door, um, and uh, just stay there, um, although it is 22 hours to New York City from here. Um, buses, we don't know. The buses are making a lot of claims. Um, nobody knows anything about engineering systems or, or whatever in buses, so don't take anything. And uh, Dr. Sag can talk about long car rides and COVID, I think. Um, let me, uh, you know, we're gonna get to this stage immunity passports, vaccination certificates, a lot of parameters uh, to be um, worked out, which are going to be very confusing and uh, uh, very confusing. Um, I won't, um, um, here is a layered approach. This is from a Harvard a group that was financed by the airline um, industry, NPIs, you know, at each stage, what should be done? It's like anything else, layered approach. You know, I'm not gonna be happy flying until every airline is rigidly enforcing, you know, every line in this layered, uh, uh, you know, approach from screening, uh, uh, screening before and perhaps viral testing before and masks and cleaning and limited service on board and limited meal service and uh, making sure the ventilation works. So it's a long list of things and many of the airlines are trying, uh, but you know they really need to learn how to do it well before the public is going to um, feel um, safe again. This is some common sense. Um, this is uh, some common sense um, advice about hotels and and other uh, places you can find on, on the CDC um, on the CDC website, although nothing about you know um, uh, personal protection um, uh, for casual um, sex that tends to occur frequently in travelers. So sorry, I went um, I went right up until my time. But for anybody that can stay, let me um, stop sharing. For anybody that can stay, I'm happy to uh, answer uh, any questions. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, it's one, so some people will have to leave. Um, I have a question that uh, Wake Manny left, but uh, he had to, to step out. He was wondering if you have any thoughts at this point about hotels or uh, just uh, places to stay. You know, what are people in general doing? Do you have concerns? Yeah, sorry, that was, uh, I just flashed through my last um, slide, you know, it's person to person. I mean, the more you can distance, uh, the better. So, I mean, you should be able to um, get a low floor room so you can take the stairs in front of the elevator, you know, contactless, uh, you know, check in, um, you know, um, on an app. Don't go to the bar, don't go to the restaurant, don't be in the room when they come, when the person comes to uh, clean, uh, you know, to clean the room. 
um, you know, it's just a matter of spacing. And, you know, the way things are now, most hotels are, are you know, very empty anyway. So it's no problem, you know, spacing out people. Um, check that the hotel is, uh, many hotels will, um, you know, although fomites aren't so important, they will like not book somebody for at least 24 hours into a room, you know, once it's vacated. So you need to check, you know, you need to check on all those things. But the key thing is, you know, stay, you know, stay away from other people. If you can get in and get out of the hotel um, and check in and check out without seeing anybody, you know, um, that, that's the ideal thing. And you need to figure out how to do that. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody, either in the chat or um, verbal? All right, well. Yeah, uh, I said Diamond Princess will be made into a movie. I mean, the right, I mean, it's all these ships. The Diamond Princess got the most publicity, but I can tell you there's probably, there's probably 20 ships that have equal horror stories um, that you know just haven't come to light yet. All right, David, thank you so much. Okay, bye now. Oh, actually, there was one more, uh, people are leaving, but anyway, uh, Lynn was asking, which seat would you choose on a flight? Ah, so, um, Con so it's controversial, you know, early on it said get a window seat, seat because, um, you know, because aisle traffic and you're going to be exposed to more people um, sitting, um, um, you know, sitting on the um, sitting on the aisle, um, you know, then it was said, you know, maybe get a middle seat because of the airflow. Um, th this Australian study showed a uh, through a monkey wrench into it um, because in the Australian study, which as I said, is the best done study, they actually showed higher risk in people at the window seat, statistically higher risk in people at the window seat uh, than, than, than in other seats. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure um, that there's any good strategy, but, um, you know, I think staying away from the aisle is definitely, you know, the best. I mean, um, you know, stay, uh, what I would do is, you know, staying away from the aisle and telling the flight attendant not even to talk to me or bother with me uh, or, or, or whatever, you know, is the best thing. You know, sitting on the aisle, you know, if they do do a drink or, or a meal service, which really they shouldn't be doing, you know, people should be getting a bag of food when they get on the plane if, if, if they need to eat, and that should be it, and they don't need snacks or glasses of wine or anything like that. But, you know, obviously the flight attendant, you know, leaning over the aisle person to talk to the person, you know, in the, in the window seat is, is, is my nightmare scenario. And um, I'm just not sure we're ever going to get to the stage where every flight attendant gets, you know, until we get one of these miracle rapid tests, you know, I'm not sure that the airlines are going to be testing every flight crew every day before they, uh, before they work. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, anybody else just send me any questions you have. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.